Hello everybody, welcome to Wednesday Night Oasis. I'm glad you're with us tonight. We are in part four of this series titled Hope. Hope part four today is, is Wednesday, September 22nd. I believe it's the 22nd. Hold on, let me look real quick to make sure I'm not telling you the wrong thing. It is Wednesday, the 22nd is right, yeah. Yeah, it's the 22nd. So, man, it's flying by. February will just be behind us here pretty quick. And uh, this is what? This is like uh, coming up on... Uh, um, before you know it, it's going to be March and April. Man, I don't know where it's going, but it's going by fast. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We are we are in part four of the series titled Hope. And the idea behind the series is what brings hope into our lives and what are some of the answers to the questions that we deal with on a daily basis or something that may come into our mind. And in part one, we talked about why do bad things happen to good people? In part two, we asked the question that I think people have asked in their lives more than once, are my prayers getting through? Last week, we talked about something that people are certainly thinking about now is, are we coming to the end times? You know, especially those of us who are in Christ, we hear about the end time prophecies and, and wonder, is this it? So if you didn't get a chance to listen to that message, Go back and check it out because I think you might like it. I, well, I, I, it's, a, it's biblical anyway, so go ahead and, and listen to that. Today, I want to ask another question that people are confused about. Even people, some in Christ, are confused about. Here's the question. Is hell real or is this it? Are we living in it today? Isn't that amazing? The truth is, is that hell is something that we don't like to deal with. Churches hardly ever talk about hell because they, they want to know if you're, is your church one of those hell and damn uh, 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 fire type churches? Are you one of the ones that Try to scare people into submission and and all of that stuff and and uh, the the truth is that, that I want you to know today is that uh, hell is a real place, just like heaven is a real place. You see, we can't say that hell's a real place because we don't want to deal with it, or we want to make light of it because we don't want to talk about the terrible parts of what it what it really means. Um, I, I, we, we often hear music and, and hear rock and roll so songs that uh, glorify hell in a way almost, you know. People make jokes about it. There's been, a, there's been songs written like Highway to Hell, right? Why, why would you want to go on a highway to hell? But there was a strong song written like that. Uh, it's not a song that we'll end up singing at church one of the Sundays. I guarantee you that. See, the the thing is, people make jokes about it. I've had I've heard people say, uh, "Where do you want to go? You want to go to heaven or you want to go to hell?" And and people, some people make fun of it and say. Well, I'd like to go to hell because all my friends are there. No, you wouldn't. See, hell is a real place. And we're going to talk about that tonight some. Now, I know many of you who are listening understand the truth about hell. But I want us to really get it down deep inside because a conversation may break out one day and... You want to know what to think about it or what to say about it or how do I respond to that? And I don't blame you because I I do too. Let me say that 
um, it's shocking what people think. I've, I've talked to people before who are even Christ followers and they say, no, I, I don't think hell is a real place. I think it is a, a, an allegory, meaning um, it's an analogy. It's, a, it's, a, it's not really a place it just means you're going to, you're going to go through something terrible. That's what people think. Or um, someone said, my kids torment me every day. I think this is like what hell's going to be like. No, no, it isn't. Someone said that I think hell is real, but... I'm not going there because I try to be a good person and help other people whenever I can. Well, if, if one of those responses play with you, kind of makes sense or what you would say, then you need to stay tuned to our message tonight because we're going to talk about the realities, the biblical realities of hell. How one goes there and how one stays out of there. You join us for that. Before we jump in, let's pray. Well, dear Lord, as we talk about something that is often not talked about in churches or in the Christian world, Father, give us the boldness and the strength and the courage to speak the truth. Lord, open up our hearts, open up our ears, open up our minds to understand God's teaching concerning this very real place that some people will go even though they don't have to. Lord, do we pray, Father, through this message that you give us a burden on our hearts for those who are lost. Use us to bring them into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to welcome you all tonight. I'm glad you're with us uh, as we jump into this message tonight about hell I want you to know that none of it will be really based on my opinion. And if I do give an opinion, you'll know it because I'll say, this is my opinion, not a passage. And so um, I want us to relate the things of God and the things that he tells us about to our own lives and to understand that God is never going to show us things that he's going to say that was for then and this is for now. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions about hell that people have is that it's not a real place. People think, uh, I don't think about it and talk about it. Uh, it isn't there because if I don't think about it, and I don't talk about it, then I don't ever have to deal with it. And if it isn't there, I don't have to, to worry about it. And I don't have to think that there are people that I loved who have gone, who have left us that might be there right now. That's a terrible thing. It's a tough thing. I mean, it's a tough one to deal with, especially if you had a loved one like a mom or a dad that you loved deeply. See, people don't really want to deal with the realities of hell because somebody that they loved deeply may have gone there. Well, tonight, uh, I'm not trying to bring... Um, sorrow into your life and trying to share the truth about a very real place. There are whole lines of believers out there, people who are called uh, universalist and there's this thing called universalism that they're a part of. 
universalism says hell's not real, it's not a real place, um, and nobody's going there. There was a Time Magazine article that was written, oh, about three years ago, I guess it was, by a pastor named Robert Bell um, from Michigan. Pastor Bell was promoting his book that encouraged his belief that no one goes to hell and everyone goes to heaven. Well, it's dangerous to think that way because it's just not true. No matter how much we would love it to be that way, if everyone was going to heaven, why would we need our sins forgiven? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why would the apostle Paul say, I beg you to reconcile to God? Why are we here if everyone is going to heaven anyway? Those are all very good questions, right? We have to think about that. The question was asked to some pastor that, that teaches this. Why do you say that there is no hell? And the answer that they have is because it's a more loving message. Let me tell you that if you are doing that, there is nothing loving about teaching false gospels. But yet pastors say, I would rather avoid the question, I would rather not teach about hell because people are, will become fearful or they will be sorrowful because of their loved ones that may not be in heaven. And let me tell you, you are doing a disservice. It is not our job. Friends, it's not my job as a pastor to decide what to tell you and what not to tell you. It's my job to speak God's truth. Even, even when we don't want to hear it. Does that make any sense? See, have you ever talked to people who think hell is going to be a party? I have people say, I, I want to go there because all my friends are going to be there. Woohoo, let's party. We'll have a big party there. Mark Twain said, I will take heaven for the climate and hell for the company. Ted Turner, you ever hear of him? said, I'm going to hell because all my friends are going to be there. When I hear things like that, it tells me that people don't know what the truth is about hell. And it's a disservice. It's a terrible thing. I mean, Tonight, I'm gonna, I hope you're going to take notes about this. And if you have a, a notebook, I, can, I encourage you to do that, to, take out a, to get yourself a, a Bible lesson or a Bible teaching notebook, Oasis notebook. That's a good thing. Call it an Oasis notebook and take notes on what we're talking about because it will help you remember what we say. So what do we know about hell? What do we know about hell? The first thing we know that the Bible, what the Bible um, says about hell is this. Hell is a real place. I want you to turn with me over to Matthew chapter 13. I think I told you that at the beginning, right, didn't I? Matthew chapter 13. Here's what it says. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin 
and all who do evil. They will throw them into a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is that a loving God? It's a just God. God is a loving, just God. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 16, verse 24. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. You know what that is, right? That comes from a parable that was told by Jesus about someone who had gone to hell. Two guys, they died. One guy goes uh, to the, the goes to hell, and he's pleading to do this. Then look at go to verse twenty seven now saying Luke 16, 27, the guy makes a request to God. He answers, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to the place of torment. As we read about hell, there's a basic truth about hell that people miss sometimes. It's the second point in your notes, or for your notes. Hell is a place of eternal suffering. Some don't believe that. Matthew 25, 46. Here's what you should know before I read that. Some don't believe that because they want to cover themselves in case they think they might go there. Or they think it would be too difficult to believe that someone that they love is in eternal suffering. I get that. But if you're in Christ, hell is not for you. And it's important for us to understand that truth. Matthew 25, 46 says this, then they will go away to eternal punishment. They will, they will go, go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. It's, it's saying that this, the, the ones who are righteous, who are Christ following, who are people who are belong to Christ, they're going to um, eternal life in heaven. See, not only is heaven, not only is hell uh, a place of terrible suffering, but we will remember the opportunities we had to accept Christ. Can you imagine being tormented day and night but every every moment knowing knowing that you could have accepted Christ and you didn't do it you didn't do it because of your pride or you didn't do it because of your unbelief or because it didn't fit into your world. Too many rules. You led yourself to believe that, oh, I'll accept Christ someday when I'm done partying, and someday never came, and it was too late. See, you imagine being in a place absent of God, being reminded that you did not have to be there. That 
that's uh, that's a hard one. It's a hard one to stop uh, to to uh, to swallow. We just read in Matthew where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth in eternal darkness. In Luke, Jesus talked about eternal fire and burning. In Mark, we are told that hell is a place of eternal torment and and punishment. The guy in the parable in Luke chapter 16 possesses the ability to think, to feel, to touch, and to remember. And he's in hell. The experience is described as gnashing of teeth. Have you ever hit your thumb with a hammer and you made a screaming sound? Gnashing of teeth. You deal with pain for a second. Hell is dealing with that type of pain for eternity. Eternity is kind of a, I looked up that word eternity and I found out that um, eternity means forever. It means never ending. Do you know what's interesting? There are not many stories told uh, of people who have died and went to hell. There are tons of stories about people who have died and have gone to heaven. I guess no one wants to admit that they went to hell when they died. There was a doctor named um, uh, Maurice Rawlings who was a cardiologist and a professor at the University of Tennessee. He, he was also an atheist. He, he wrote a book about some of the patients that have had near-death experiences. Not all of them were experiences where they were uh, going towards the light. In fact, some were just the opposite. Listen, listen to this one. Here's one that they had. This story happened when he was um, resuscitating a patient of his. Each time the man would regain his heartbeat, the patient screamed, I'm in hell. He was terrified. He pleaded for me to help him. I was scared to death. I noticed a, a legitimate look on the, on the man's face of terror like I had never seen before. The man had a tormented look on his face that will never leave my mind. After the man revived, he said, hell is real. I know because I saw it. And soon after, he accepted Christ as his Savior, and so did I. So did the doctor. Can you imagine that? I don't know about you, but I hear stories like that, and it kind of gives me the chills. Can you imagine having a near-death experience and the death, the, the place that you're going is not uh, flowers and butterflies, but torment and burning and screaming and gnashing of teeth. Hell has eternal suffering in it. There is mental suffering. There's physical suffering. There's emotional suffering. There is suffering. The Bible says that there's eternal darkness. You imagine all that suffering and you can't see anything? It's dark. You hear people in agony around you, but you can't see because the darkness is that terrible. Here's the third point in your notes about hell. Did I give you the second point? Yeah, hell's a place of suffering. The third point is this. Hell is a place of eternal separation from God. We think this world is bad. Do you imagine what the world would be like if 
it had no Christ followers in it? Look, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. This is the New Living Translation. Here's what it says. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come on his mighty, with his mighty angels, excuse me, in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of the Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. I think that's probably the saddest sentence ever written. Verse 9, again, let me read that verse 9 again. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. People who argue that there is no hell pull out the scripture and they misinterpret what's being said. Let's, let's look at it. Let's look at this. 2 Corinthians 5.19 That God was reconciled to the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. We read that, right? You see that, you read that, it says, okay, see, God has reconciled the world to himself. The world is everyone, so there is no hell. There you go. Everyone is reconciled. Yes, that's true. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So what does that say for those who do not believe in him, those who do not accept him, those who do not walk with him? They do not have the promise of eternal life in heavenly places. You see, God reconciles the world to himself through Jesus. But people don't want to read that part. They don't want to accept that part. See, if you want the promise of reconciliation, it has to be in Christ. See how it says that? the world to himself in Christ. Yeah, but I don't get it. How can a good and loving God send someone to hell when he knows how hell is? How could he do that? Here's what people don't get. God doesn't send anyone to hell. People, chose, people choose to go there. The people have to realize that, that there's something so important that they need to understand. And here it is. Hell wasn't created for man or woman. It wasn't created for us. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, for his demons. And the sad thing is people are going there because they never, they never expect to go there. And then they find themselves there. You think it's hot in Phoenix in the summer. Let me tell you that they have not seen anything yet. In, in, in Isaiah 14, um, it talks about it in Isaiah chapter 14 and in Matthew chapter 25. Let's look at the Matthew 25 verse. Here's what it says. Then he will say to those on, the, on his left, depart from me, you are cursed into eternal fire. Into what fire? Eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Prepared for who? The devil and his angels. 
See, God's plan for restoration happens through Jesus. And he doesn't want anyone to perish. It's not his will for anyone to go there. We heard that before. You ever hear the phrase, your parents probably said this to you, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And your response usually is, yeah, right. How must it hurt our Father in heaven when people find themselves going to hell because of choices that they make? The next thing we have to recognize is this. God is both good and just. You think about that, God is focused. We focus on the goodness and the loving side of God because that's what people want to hear about. But there are people who do not accept Christ who are going to hell. And they think that's just not right because God is a loving God. The, my pastor tells me that all the time. And he, he would be right in telling you that. But he's also a just God. Romans eleven twenty two says this, Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Listen, some people think that means if you're saved and you do something wrong, you're going to hell and that's not right. Here's what's being said here. God says to his children, we can do this the hard way or the easy way you choose. You choose the blessing or the curse, the acceptance or denial of Jesus. It, it's, it comes down to that. Uh, think of our lives. We want justice in the world, but just justice for uh, the other guy and not us so much. I'm driving down the freeway, the speed limit 65 miles an hour, and somehow a car blows by me going 80 miles an hour, 85 miles an hour. And you and I say, where is a cop when you need one? But now, if that was you and I driving 85 miles an hour, not that I don't know if my car goes that fast, but say say my car was driving that fast on its own, uh, going by, we would say, I hope there's no cop around. How come we want justice for the other guy, but not for ourselves? That's the truth. Second Peter 3 9 says this The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants us to make that choice. So how do I know where I'm going? How do I know if I'm going to heaven or how do I, you know, I, there, there was, I watched these street interviews from time to time. Um, Kirk Cameron does a very good job at that. If you ever get a chance to watch some of these, uh, I think it's called Master's Touch or something like that. I'm not sure what it's called, but He has a program with when he does street interviews and ask people where you go when you go to heaven or hell. And they go, well, I think I'm, I think I'm going to heaven. Well, great. Why do you think that? Because I live a good life. I try to treat people fairly most of the time. I help little old ladies across the street. I think that's good. Well, it is good. 
Those are all very good, commendable things. But none of those things have anything to, to do with salvation. Now here's the part that people are just going to hate. Don't turn this off after I tell you this. There will be people who are murderers in heaven and people who lived a, a helpful life in hell. That just doesn't seem right, does it? It only seems right when you understand that the pathway to heaven is through Jesus and Jesus alone. It has nothing to do with how good you are. It has nothing to do with how much you give to church. But if, if you give a lot, you might be accepted. No, I'm only kidding. But, but, but listen, I, I, I joke about that, but I'm not, uh, here, here's the truth. The only way you and I are going to get to heaven is by accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's why we do that every week. We ask people if they want to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. But we don't do that just to fill time. We do that because we all need to be praying at the end of that service that people will make a decision for him. Friends, there's, there is just a few steps to know where it is you're going. Here's the first one. Recognize that there is only one way to God. There's not multiple pathways that lead to God, all different religions, all different backgrounds through different things. As long as you're faithful to those things, you know what? Those other ways are all dead ends. The only opening is through Jesus. Oprah, you remember Oprah? Well, she's still around. Oprah on her show used to have all of these different crazy people who came on her show that talked about crystals or trees or worshiping this or that or whatever and there was a there was a thought for a, a while there that all paths lead to God and then in Oprah's final show and I had a chance to watch that because even though I was not a watching Oprah fan, someone who's been accomplished and been on TV that long, you want to watch the last goodbye show kind of thing. You know, that's me anyway. Well, here it is, the end of the show. And Oprah said that I believe that there are two things that have made my career a success, she said. One was the faithfulness of my viewers, and the second was the grace of God through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I was floored at that. Wow. Now, either a transformation happened during this whole time of this program that she's had, or she was just trying to keep an open mind for everybody to hear the baloney, whatever it might have been. I don't know what was bringing her to that, but she gave God, Jesus, the credit. And for that, she should be commended. Listen, all religions have some thread of truth. that everyone believes. I mean, there are di all the different religions. There's treat others like you want to be treated. I think every religion teaches that. Care for one another. I think they all believe that. But there's only one that says Jesus is the only way to God. And that's being a Christ follower. 
even these other religions, the ones that who are the leaders of those religions, none of them claim to be God. None of them claim to be the pathway to God. Only Jesus does. Now, either Jesus was telling the truth or he was a crazy man. And I'm going to tell you that he was telling the truth. There's other religions out there that they have a word that describes what their religion believes. It's called do, do, D-O. If you do this, if you do that, if you do this, if you do the right things, if you, then you will go to heaven. But Christianity doesn't teach that. Christianity teaches you a different word, not do done you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ who paid the price for you see there is a hell there is a way to stay away from there and the only way is through accepting Christ as your savior if you never do that you're going to hell I don't even like saying that because the reality is that the choice is yours. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this. Jesus answers, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. I don't have to be a brain surgeon to understand that verse. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. John three thirty six, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him, on them. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have not, since we, in, sorry, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? See? The passages could keep on rolling in. So, all right, I get it. Why did God allow hell to exist then? Why didn't he destroy the devil and not give us a choice? Why didn't he just create us that way, that we do, without choice? F frankly, everybody, I think choices are overrated. Whenever I have a choice to make, I have a 50-50 chance of making the wrong choice. Here's the answer. He wanted us to make a choice to love God. Love isn't love if you don't choose to do it. See, God doesn't want to force himself on anyone. He wants us to choose him. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21 says this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God will make his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. This is the New Living Translation. 
You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gate to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. Friends, friends, uh, uh, as much as I hate to say it, hell's real, and it's for eternity, and many people will go there because they're making poor choices, and they're choosing to go there rather than choosing Christ for their salvation. That's why I always ask people, you make the choice. Here's one last passage. Deuteronomy 30, 19 through 20. This also is the New Living Translation. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord, your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to life. This choice to accept Christ is the key to your life. Friends, do you know that key? Do you have it? Does the Holy Spirit live within you? If you've accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you and it's your seal of your salvation. It's the thing that seals us in Christ. It could never be broken. But if you don't have that seal, if you don't have that spirit in you, if you've never accepted Jesus, hell's real. And it was never meant for you. But people will go there because they do not know Christ as their Savior. Think about that. Thanks for joining me tonight. This was a tough one. It's hard to hear because we don't like that. But it's completely the truth. Love you guys. Have a great night. See you Sunday. Starting a brand new series. You're going to love it. I'll talk to you later.